don't touch it. Obviously, it is important, otherwise, it might have blown up. So, removing the sun, like you do a KYR or something, and after six weeks, you remove it. It's not like that. Once the shunt, always the shunt, 70 to 80 percent of children with hydrocephalus on a shunt are shunt dependent. Therefore, removal of the shunt is not an option. Unless, of course, there is a complication. Treatment of hydrocephalus is either medical or surgical. Medical is essentially to tide over a crisis. It's a temporary thing. It's not on a permanent basis. Epidazolamide, frusamide, isosulfide, all these are the drugs which can be given. Surgically, in neonates and infants with say intraventricular hemorrhage or something, maybe ventricular taps can be done, things such kind that the CSF is normal and then we can go in and put in a shunt. Open ventricular draining used to be there, intracranial shunts used to be done. Extracranial shunts are still being done, that is either a ventricular peritoneal or a ventricular atrium. And now, in certain cases, we do what is known as EGD or endoscopic transventriculostomy, where you do a fenestration like you see over there with an endoscope. You go into the ventricle, go into the floor of the ventricle, through the uh, hole, through the third ventricle down into the remaining, and you establish sort of an internal shunt, and that will take care of the thing. But of course, it cannot be done in all patients of hydrocephalus because the pathology may be different. Now, medical treatment is basically to delay surgical therapy. Premature, sometimes, who have intraventricular bleed may not always require a GP shunt or anything, in which case medical treatment may work. And they may either decrease production or it may increase absorption. But the complications of these acetazolamide and all are electrolyte imbalance and metabolic acidosis. So if any child is put on any of these drugs to prevent further increase in hydrocaps, you need to monitor their electrolytes and everything. Now an ideal extracranial shunt must drain excess CSS, maintain normal intracranial pressure and produce no complication. There is no such shunt as of now. Let me thank you. Either the patient must have been following up with you who have been shunted by us, or they come back and bug us, so we try to send them to the other unit. Because we don't want to take the headache of shunt complication because there are a lot. Now, shunt is based on a shunt valve, and it basically, as the word suggests, it shunts. So, if there is excess of fluid in the brain, you shunt it to some other part. In the old days, they used to put it into the atrium, but now we prefer to put it into the brain, into the peritone. Now there are two types of valves, what are known as differential pressure valves. Either it is a low resistance valve, which is either spring ball valves or diaphragmatic valves, which are more in the foreign based ones. And the Indian ones are the slip valves, which are high resistance ones. Now this formula given below is, looks very nice, but it's basically how does it work, the perfusion pressure of the Valve remaining open is based on the intraventricular pressure plus hydrostatic pressure. Now, hydrostatic pressure is zero if the child is in supine position. It is only more or less if it is in a vertical position where the hydrostatic is from the skull to the peritoneum or to the atrium. Minus the distal cavity pressure in deficient it will be the peritoneal cavity plus the closing pressure of the valve. So the closing pressure of the valve is just one of the variants which tells you when the valve will or when the shunt will stop functioning. If this valve isn't there, then all the CSF will go down into the peritoneum. So therefore the valve's work is to prevent complete drainage at the same time maintain a certain pressure in the ventricle. Now this is how a ventricular peritoneal Indian wedge shunt looks like. It has three parts. One is the ventricular end. Then there is a peritoneal head, there is a pump, and the end of the peritoneal head has a lot of slit valve. That means it's a slit in the long axis of the tubing, and which opens out at a given pressure. So therefore, these are the high resistance pressure. So only when the pressure in the brain or in the cerebral ventricle increases above X millimeters, the slit valve opens and allows CSF to go into the peritoneal cavity. 
moment that pressure comes to a fixed level, say 50, it closes and therefore the remaining stops going down. And this is how it is put. Now, this is an eccentric procedure. We do it even in new bombs, where the upper incision is meant for the ventricular end to go in and then subcutaneously we pass it and then the second incision is in the abdomen where we push it behind the liver. So we have a complete uh, subcutaneous tract where the shelf is going through, upper end is inside into the ventricle, lower end is inside behind the liver. Shelf complications, now these are the biggest problems. They are either malfunction, infection, seizures because we have entered the brain and gone into the ventricle, subdural accumulation because there is some leak on the side of the shunt, Cranial thin osteosis because now in a childhood uh, we are on the mastoid because you need something to press. And the parents are always taught to give two, three shots in, the, in between. The reason is it takes away the block because the upper end of the ventricular end is in the ventricle and either cerebral debris or it can go and get stuck to the choroid plexus and can get blocked. And if it gets blocked unnecessarily, we have to open up, remove that and push in another one. So by doing the pump, it's sort of um, like we do for the bathrooms. We keep the channel open, both the upper and the lower. As well as the pump is useful because when we want to check whether the upper end is blocked or the lower end is blocked, this is how we do it. When we press the shunt, if it cannot be pressed, that means the lower end is blocked because when you press it, it pushes the CSF distally. Now if we cannot just push in that pump, that means the lower end is blocked. If it goes inside and then doesn't get refilled, then the chances are that the upper end is blocked. So we know where to exactly put in our incision so that we get rid of the obstruction. Here there is. It suddenly blocks here. Beyond this, there is no shunt. That means it has fractured, it has disconnected, and that's the cause of the problem. Infection can be either outside or inside. Outside is along the shunt track on the subcutaneous region, or inside is within the shunt, what is known as shunt colonization. And therefore, depending upon where it is, we need to take steps to correct it. Unique to a ventricular peritoneal shunt is because suddenly you are producing ascites artificially by pushing in a lot of CSF into the peritoneum. So if there is a pattern process as vaginalis, you are going to get either an invernal hernia or a hydrocyl suddenly coming up and the parents get panicking and suddenly what happens is in the shirt and he has got hernia. So it's just that pattern process as vaginalis which has now been filled up by the CSF which has come from above. Aside with cyst formation, intra-abdominal cyst can be found in which case they can get obstructed and we need to remove the uh, shunt and push it into another place in the peritoneal cavity. Intestinal obstruction, volvular, because the shunt acts like a, a band around which the intestines can go around and therefore can give us to obstruction. Very often we have seen, or not very often, but we have seen shunt coming out through the umbilicus, coming out through the rectum and the parents thinking this is some sort of a worm. But basically it was just the lower end of the Territory laid out a division which has gone through the rectum and has come out. Spread of neoplasm, if there is a malignancy or um, CA in the brain along the shunt tract, it can come down. Infection in the peritoneal cavity, post meningitis, if they have put, that can come down straight, they are giving a direct access to the peritoneum and primary peritonitis is another thing. Now, once the shunt gets blocked, of course, headaches, vomiting, lethargy and certain subtle signs may come. The prognosis is depending on the cause of the hydrocephalus. Now, 50% of intraventricular hemorrhage may require a shunt, which means 50% may not require. So therefore, again, after removal of posterior fossa tumor, only 20% may need a shunt, 80% may not require a shunt. And if we are getting a satisfactory control with medical therapy and stable signs. We can hold on without putting in a shunt. Now, as I said before, we are making an antenatal pickup of many structural anomalies in all the um, systems.
existence of the body in CNS is number one. Highest number of antenatally picked up uh, structural deformities are in the CNS. In which about 12% may be lethal and prognosis cannot be made only on imaging. And this is very important that we seek to counsel the parents. Because when we sit and talk to the parents, we can only tell them what are the chances, what are the problems associated with, say, hydrocephalus or with hydrocephaly or with meningomyelosis. We cannot tell them that this child has this, this, this thing. We just tell them that your child may have any one or more of the following. And that is important because sometimes we make statements which do not corroborate with what happens after the birth of the child. Because it has happened with many more miles in where we have talked to the parents, told them that there may be paraplegia or paraparesis, there may be bladder bowel incontinence, there may be hydrocephalus, and we may need to do a lot of surgeries. When the child is born, the many more miles in is there, there is no hydrocephalus, no paraparesis, no bladder bowel. And they say, what are you talking about now? We told us that these, all these things could happen. I said, exactly, it could happen. I didn't say they have happened. So that's the important thing is when we counsel, we have to be very careful. We have to give them a full explanation because if it is now before 20 weeks, they have an option of terminating. If it is beyond 20 weeks, as of now, we do not have an option of termination. The advantage is, of course, early pickup, known prognosis, like hydrocephaly or an anencephaly, you know that there is no question about what the prognosis you can definitely talk about termination, provided it's less than 20 weeks. If it is isolated anomaly or other systems are also involved, this is important. And if we are going to continue the pregnancy, then what would be the time of delivery, what would be the type of delivery, whether it would be normal or fetal infection, and the place of delivery, that means the nursing home is already a major institute where pediatric surgery and neonatal surgery is available. However, the disadvantage is, which is why we have to be very careful and we keep our both feet on the ground, is that diagnosis may be inaccurate. Hydrocephalus and hydrocephaly may be mistaken. But that patient of hydrocephaly was delivered by cesarean section, assuming it was hydrocephalus. So it it's not a correct thing that was done anyway. All anomalies may not be picked up. And once the diagnosis is made and if pregnancy is going to continue, the parents and their family are in high tension till the child is actually delivered and we find out what exactly is happening. And as I said, imaging, whether it is CT, whether it is MRI, whether it is ultrasound, do not give function. They only give anatomy. So therefore, we cannot talk about function or what is going to be there. Like not all hydrocephalus are going to be morons. Not that no, no, non-hydrocephalus are not morons. <laughs> Inaccurate effects are possible. As I said, in meningomyelosis, not all of them will have bladder bowel or paraplegia or any of these things. So therefore, when we counsel parents, we have to explain very carefully, do chromosomal anomaly typing if required and then explain what are the surgeries that may be required on their children so that they can take a clear decision either way. Ultrasound to be done every three weeks to look for sudden increase or a resolution. If there is a sudden increase then we are thinking about progressive hydrocephalus, maybe an early delivery and early therapy. If it is resolving, we may not need to do anything. Again, ventricular amniotic, this was being done. See, again, like Ira was talking, since we are 10 years behind, we don't get the mistakes they made. They were very enthusiastic about doing fetal intervention. So, in all patients of hydrocephalus, they started doing ventricular amniotic shunt. The ventricular end was pushed inside the ventricle of the fetus. The other end of the shunt was lying in the amniotic cavity. So, they were sort of doing a drainage of the hydrocephalus and then allowing the child to be born and then they said, look, we have done a great job. And then they found the morons were still being born. So now they have stopped doing it. They have given up. They have realized that that's not making a difference in the function of the child. And it is the same whether you do the shunt before or whether you do the shunt soon after birth. Probably the uh, development and everything is almost the same. And therefore, 
the risk both to the mother and the child in doing a fetal intervention is higher than just doing a repetition in a newborn. Like some of these children are really pathetic. Coming to CNS tuberculosis, uh, this is mainly because of ineffective control program, drug resistance, as Dr. Ira was talking, increased incidence of HIV, overcrowding cure, poor nutrition. Now, this is a little bit about pathology, which I am not going to go into details of how exactly the tuberculous meningitis actually occurs and then causes an obstruction. But untreated tuberculous meningitis, the duration for the, from diagnosis to death may be as short as four weeks. And that is the importance of diagnosis of tuberculosis and uh, tuberculous meningitis. Now, hydrocephalus is due to either obstruction of the basal system, obstruction of outflow of fourth ventricle, occlusion of aqueduct by tuberculous exudate, exudate and commonly, as I said, acquired are usually the communicating, not the non-communicating. Now, this is one of the most common types of CNS tuberculosis. Sometimes they have a poor response because we have done too little too late. The highest incidence is usually between 9 months to 9 years. Um, smaller number of organisms may be required and lot of extra pulmonary cases may be also picked up. And it's a complication of primary infection within 6 months. So therefore, once you get a pickup of a tuberculosis, be careful that these, these children, especially in infants and all, they don't go in for a tuberculous meningitis. Presentations, fever headache, maybe seizures, focal neurological deficits and rarely coma. Of course, the CSS diagnosis should be done and I'm not going to go into the details about the therapy for tuberculosis per se. But indications for shunt in tuberculous meningitis is either a failure of medical treatment and progress of hydrocephalus. If there is a hydrocephalus which is already obvious, a cerebral abscess which is there, tuberculosis with coma, spinal arachnoidosis and a CSF protein, less than 100 mg you can go ahead. If it is more and you put in a shunt, the shunt is likely to get blocked and therefore may not work and you have to take out the shunt. So in those cases you may either do a ventric tap or there is a reservoir in which is with a ventricular uh, catheter inside. So you just keep picking the reservoir and withdrawing the, the CSF in order to keep the tuberculosis under control of the hydrocephalus. So